ladies and gentlemen. Please silence your phones and hush your babies. The show is about to start. Hello everyone and welcome to the Nemo & Co predictions show where we are going to give our predictions about what will happen at this general conference. Isn't that exciting? And as I said in the short that I advertised this week, I am not alone but I am joined by an illustrious panel of guests, um, pretty much all of whom I think you'll see over the weekend uh, as co-commentators in the full-on halftime show. So let's say hi to everyone. We've got the ladies of 21st Hello. Century Saints. We have Peter Bleakley of Mormon Civil War. Uh, I'm around, I guess. I'm, I'm here to corral them mainly. Um, but I've been asking for your predictions all week. Which? Why doesn't everyone in the UK have brand new solar panels? Who wants to answer that question? I've been getting that advert a lot on my YouTube. I don't know about anyone else. Um, and he'll <laughs> tell you it's not politics, it's not economics, it's. And then I press skip, so I don't know. Um, we are going to be looking at the predictions. <laughs> Uh, <laughs> let me get on to something that people actually care about. Um, we're going to be asking who will speak. That is the main question of tonight. Uh, so let's crack on, shall we? As as we know, there's a letter that's sent out. I don't know if it's ever read from the pulpit anywhere. It's never read in my wards. But they announced the upcoming 194th Annual General Conference. The First Presidency, of course, have to announce that the conference is happening. Otherwise, no one would know that it happens on the first weekend of April every year. You know, you could almost set your clock by it. So, but what is interesting from this letter is the program lengths, that the Saturday and Sunday morning and afternoon sessions are two hours, but the Saturday evening session is 90 minutes. Um, so what's that about? We thought they were finishing early the past couple of times they did it, but it seems to be an official thing now that, the Saturday evening session goes for 90 minutes. Maybe they realized I was staying up till nearly four in the morning to talk about it and they decided to throw me a bone. Um, let me know what you think of that in the comments. Uh, but yeah, I think we should move straight on to the biblical prophecy that Ruth's made us aware of. Ruth, do you want to talk us through uh, the biblical prophecy that we all have for this weekend? Well, all I'm just saying is don't get in the big shop and maybe don't, you know, put a full tank of petrol in your car because there's going to be a, a um, is it cicadas? A biblical um, swarm of cicadas, double the amount as, as normal, mm. plus a lunar eclipse at the same time, solar eclipse at the same time. So yeah, end of the world. Well, I mean, you think about, the, so the last time that happened, they say was 1803 when Thomas Jefferson was president of the US, um, which is a fascinating this, in and of itself. Before this Mormon nonsense started. Well, indeed, this is older than the church. But <laughs> what what's really interesting for me is that imagine being uh, a community of people that don't understand this. They don't understand what's going on. The sky goes dark in the middle of the day and trillions of insects appear. Y you would genuinely think the end of the world has arrived. It's a, it's a pretty apocalyptic type scene. Ooh. And if, am I right in thinking this is because... So cicadas come out on an, over a number of years. It takes them a number of years to kind of develop underground and then they appear all at once. And they are in different swarms, but the swarms that are 13 years apart and 17 years apart, because they're prime numbers, they coincide every 200 something years. And yeah. this is a year in which they've coincided, which means, yeah. bam, two swarms in one year. Horrific. Yeah. Oh, so Almost maybe what happened to the Egyptians. Yeah, possibly. Possibly. Mm. Um, if they have these, we need seagulls. We need, we need seagulls. lots and lots of Mormon seagulls. We need someone mm. stood by the Red Sea, ready to part it. Um, yeah. All of the above, but yeah. So it'd be interesting if they lean into that at mm. all and uh, and uh, aim to prophesy it. I've already be, had actually someone see a prophecy come true for once. Well, I've had someone in the chat tell me that I need to repent and uh oh, and Ooh. get ready to go back to the church because there's an eclipse this weekend and it's a sign of the times etc mm. so we we joke but there Ooh. are there are people yeah for sure no oh, absolutely i've been doing some following some of the, the the thankfully not very large audience social media groups there's absolute hysteria about this amongst the doomsday prepper mormons yeah. um they believe that the the shadow of the moon in these eclipses is writing the letters Aleph and Tau, which are Alpha and Omega in Greek, across America and across 
Israel and they're reading all kinds of significance into it so that there's more people ready for the second coming this year. Yeah, and, and I think uh, when when we sit in Mormonism, as we you know as we do, and we see some of the impact of that, when you think of the Chad and Laurie Daybell case, also Ruby Frank and some of of the influences they've had, and worrying about demons and and you know their children being possessed, and and we laugh about it because it's it's ludicrous. However, if you have that mindset, and and Mormonism is a, a church that believes in apocalyptic sort of end of the world happenings. It's very easy to take that next step and think, OK, well, because of that, we now need to build a bunker and, mm-hmm. and, and you could you could end up in a really mm-hmm. dark place, couldn't you? Mm-hmm. Well, we're going to we're going to part it's along... because conferences are so boring. You know, the, <laughs> everyone's been told to in their on. patriarchal blessings that you're going to be in the last days and and Nelson does all this rhetoric about the final generation and the Lord's Battalion, but then they offer utter boring dreck. So people self-actualize, they make it happen in their small little worlds um, because they've been, the church has taught them to expect all these exciting things to happen in their lifetime. And then all they can do is announce meeting schedule changes, you know, and tell us not to keep asking for revelations. Thank you very much. Um, yeah. Well, we'll get to some meeting schedule people, changes so. in a moment, but yeah, on the, <laughs> on the topic of lady people, I think we need to we need to ask the question um, because to to my mind and to my predictions, which you, you'll get my full list of predictions at the end of this show, so stay tuned. But um, we'll get through some of the audience's predictions first before that, and the panels. So there's many predictions, but the question we ask. Based, my prediction is we'll get three women speak at this conference. That's a slight spoiler, and I've managed to assemble as many women here <laughs> as the church will be able to assemble on the weekend to speak. So, oh, there we go. you know, why won't <laughs> more women speak? And I promise I'll swear more than most of the women this weekend as well. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, I think if if every time I spoke, I caused massive amounts of trauma with just the simple things that I'm saying, I maybe might think twice. Think twice. Women's conferences notoriously are not good. And we've just had the, the women's session happen. And oh my goodness, it was awful. And unfortunately, it leans into sort of the misogynistic type. Well, you know, we don't want more women to speak because they just, you know, they, they, they sound wrong, they speak wrong, they're saying, you know, they're only talking about the prophet. And, you know, it... It, it, it doesn't actually help. It doesn't address mm. the real problem. Women aren't speaking because we are not asked to speak. Nemo Sarah? asked us to come and we did. Yeah. Your thoughts before we get to uh, the, the, re- the reason? I think women are far too busy staying at home, making donuts for their husbands and looking <laughs> after the children. And how have they possibly got time to go and do something like speak at a general conference? And have you seen that what? brilliant? Sorry to interrupt you. Sorry, have you seen that brilliant yeah. um, comment by? I think it's Noodles. Somebody wrote it. It's gone off my screen now. Three point yeah. one four. So they don't make yeah. donuts; they make pie. <laughs> Oh, oh, brilliant, brilliant. Well, they can make donuts and pies and, well, they could probably have a bit more fun with those in general conference. I mean, the reality is as well is do these women even want to speak at conference where they know they're not valued? They know that they're not really listened to. They know that it's a little bit of a pat on the head, isn't it? So, Mm. Oh, well, can can I just jump in on that? Because let's face it, because there's one of the... One of my favourite places to be in conference is hanging out with the chat family here because so much insight. The problem is we can't ask to speak because one does not do that when you're a Mormon. You cannot want to do something because that's a sign that you somehow want power or authority. Um, We've got some, over the years, women have asked We've changed our tone about how we're asking. Uh, Naila McBain's wonderful book, Women at, at Church, which talks about how women could be more included exactly where they are. And um, yeah, we keep we keep saying it's not even two steps forward and, you know, it's there's, there's three steps back happening every single time. Women are not asked to speak 
or they would accept that invitation like mm. good Mormons when we're asked to do something we tend to do it mm. but then uh, I guess the the question becomes you know in the in the light of the recent Jay Annette Dennis quote that just sent the Mormon internet into us or, or particularly women in the Mormon sphere into kind of a spiraling rage um, at the idea that they were being told that they're empowered um do you not think it would be a good move for the church to maybe put women for a bit a bit further mm. forward ask more women to speak i think they'd be worried think, that they would be that would seen, just that would just make that people that. people complaining works yeah i i think that as well but i think also sometimes if a woman is able to talk and is able to use her ability or instinct or knowing as a woman to really speak in a meaningful way in church whether it's sacrament or in general conference mm -hmm. then a lot of what they're going to say is going to knock spots off what the men have to say sorry peter and nima but that's the reality of it it's going to knock spots off what a lot of the men have to say because she, really they, they only say the same thing over and over and over again don't they covenant path pay your tithing love the prophet mm -hmm. don't question and women can sometimes be significantly more insightful and they're not going to want to show the men up, are they? And no. creative. I mean, do you, if no. we all remember a few years ago the exceptional women's conference where um, the women invited a queer woman to speak and it was, it was, you know, we had never had anything like that. The hope that it gave us. I, I think one of the things that sort of members tend to fall back on is because we justify why things are the way they are i do hear a lot of members saying well we don't really want to hear women speak because we're here for the prophets you know women aren't apostles and women aren't prophets we want to hear those who are called into those positions who get revelation about what we're what we need to hear unfortunately women are still the the sort of part of the show where you can go use the bathroom or go have a chat or you know go for a stretch so women aren't being listened to and I, I just don't think they're really aware that you know that that comment about about the donuts and, and the pie mm -hmm. unfortunately it's so true so many women are sorting I, out the meals yeah and we've got mary think... asking when that was sorry jane before sarah goes uh when was that that they invited a queer woman was it about seven years ago do you know what i shall yeah. google it yeah and it, I was quite, it was quite it was it was it was not general conference not general no. conference it no, was it a wasn't. byu it was women's, a women's conference, conference i think something like so, that and yeah. the fact that we have a we, or we mm. have a or had in the past a women's conference tells you how little mind men think men in the church men think they need to pay to women's voices yeah. the fact that they feel like we need to partition that off because we don't need to listen to that part um it it's so diminishing of women's voices even the the you know proposed three that you're suggesting are going to speak at conference mm -hmm. it, they are not they are not in a position where their opinions their thoughts their um the things that they care about the um the direction of travel that they would have people go they're not listened to they are there purely to reiterate the messages that are coming from the first presidency and mm. that is their job done and dusted they don't even get paid for doing that job so they are not valued on so many different levels well, should we get to the official first presidency position on why more women don't speak oh, yeah. at a conference? Yes. Um, Peter, can it wait till after that, or do you want to go before? Um, just, just before that, um, mm -hmm. what's the peak? What's the most women they've had speak at conference? Because it's so shameless that they're now having so few. You know, they've clearly relegated the official women's session, which at least gave women a, a focused space, although, of course, mm -hmm. half the talking was done by men at those. But you'd yeah. think they'd make some kind of basic effort to compensate by having a, a somewhat increased number of women speaking. But the fact that they've ever, you know, they're just relentlessly having so few women speaking, they mm. just don't care. These men, at, they, they're not even pretending mm. to care. It's a complete slap in the face. The what, peak do we know in what general was the most sessions, women ever talked? I'm just, I'm just looking yeah. now. The peak in general sessions is four. Four is the most women, as far as I can see. And as a percentage of total, what's that uh, work out as? There's well, usually many. how many how many talks in total mm. throughout the conference. Uh, you're looking at an average of probably six per session. So six times five, so thirty. Uh, yeah, thirty. So 
So four, four out of and to, by by general sessions, do you mean not women's sessions? Not women's sessions, of course, because so I there'd add be a few more them. in the years when they had a female session, like once a year yeah. they used to have the women's session of conference. In which case, well, yeah, actually, so that's and even the men there. couldn't stop speaking at that, could they? But that was a general was... session. That was a the women's session became a, one of the standardized yeah. sessions of conference, Along, so alternating with the priesthood one. Once yeah. they killed that, the most we've ever had in a year is three, I believe. Mm. Um, mm. So out of 30, we get three. So a tenth. It's a, it's a tithe, isn't it? I can see one here of five. 2022, Michelle D. Cray, Kristen M. Yee, Tracy Y. Browning, Amy A. Wright, and Raina I. Alberto. But I'm just trying to work. Oh, hang on. No, that's all the same year. My bad. <laughs> um, <laughs> you'd be looking at three in October. Three. Yes, this is all without women's sessions. So... Yeah, the most you're looking at then is four. And and I just while while you while you're checking that, mm -hmm. we, you know, just I popped it into the comments, but that uh, that conference we spoke about was indeed a BYU conference, which is clearly why it had a bit more a bit more freedom and it was a bit more sort of loose um, in its structure, and uh, it was twenty twenty one that conference where they had a queer woman speak and special shout out to all our queer folks in the chat we love you so uh, the most yeah the most women that have ever spoken um in a session yeah uh, is three in in, in one conference uh, it's four sorry it's four it's definitely four october 20 21 well, there was four women's well, but, well, but you're not counting women's sessions. Not counting conference. women's sessions, no. Well, because... even at women's sessions, men yeah. couldn't stop going to speak at them, could they? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I'm just, just counting uh, the four sessions, not priesthood, not women's. Anyway, so this is one off the overall record. Uh, we spent far too long on that. Let's have a look at this because people will be nodding off soon. Um so this was Katie Ludlow Rich who wrote an art uh, a guest column for the Exponent Two magazine, the blog. Um, and so, with her permission, I share this, and it is featured on the the website. Um, but she wrote several letters to the Office of First Presidency, Presidency asking why more women couldn't speak. And there were kind of three reasons that came round. Is um, they said to her, I want to read the whole thing. Thank you for your letter of October 2020, uh, 22nd, 2019, addressed to President Russell M. Nelson. The first presidency has discussed this concern, so they've talked about it, and asked that I respond to you on their behalf. So we have to take it at face value. The first presidency talked about this and went back to it. And that was the first presidency that we still have now, Irving Oaks and Nelson. As a matter of policy, those who are invited to speak at General Conference have been called and given authority to function throughout the entire church, hence the name General Conference. There have been a few exceptions to this practice in the past, and there may be a few exceptions in the future. You know, they've had a non-member speak before. That was a woman. She was the head of some children's organization in America back in the 50s or something. Uh, a review of the simple mathematics governing those who are authorized to speak in general conference and the number of speaking assignments available will reveal the realities of the ratios involved. So blame the maths, guys. But, you know, they could change those ratios. Another complication is the number of new general authorities called each year and the de desire of the first presidency to assign them to speak soon after they are called. It is interesting to note that given the increasing numbers of general authority 70s and the age at which one is called, some 70s may speak in general conference only once during their tenure. Oh, no, they only get to speak once. Even general authority 70s called at a relatively young age will speak only once every seven years, give or take. The women general officers speak in general conference far more often during their tenure than do the individual seventies. <laughs> Should we pause there for a moment? <laughs> oh, oh, dear. oh, it's unbelievable. Why do the women serve everywhere. for about five minutes these Are days? The women serve sympathy? for about five minutes and they're gone. <laughs> they am expecting sympathy. <laughs> no, I just to speak once. One moment, yeah, Sarah, yeah. then Jane. This is the point at which we need to praise them for their sacrifice in allowing women to have any time and opportunity whatsoever. Yeah. When they get 
so little time to pontificate to everybody. And what is that nonsense about those who have general authority throughout the whole of the church? Were they not talking about Relief Society having so much power and authority and influence well, yeah. and all the rest of it and, in a little while? So is and, that throughout the whole of the world? Richard Heath has given us the, um, the Brad Wilcox take in the chat, <laughs> which is... <laughs> What, we're asking the wrong question. Instead of asking why aren't women speaking so often, the question is why aren't the men getting to speak more often? That's that's what they're doing here. It's mental. Um, Jane, and then we'll carry on. Um, I I, th I think the one of the undertones. This this is in the same vein as. Um, and then we go home and and we listen to our wives speak, and we also have daughters, and and will they speak too? So. This is someone who feels like they hear enough from women and aren't aware that they're not hearing from a variety of women from a variety of different experiences who all have something to bring to the table. Mm -hmm. You don't get to, in one hand, talk about how uh, women have to participate equally in councils and then justify why the membership actually aren't hearing from those women mm -hmm. if you're a woman you may be hearing from them a lot more frequently but if you're a man how often are you taking notes about what women are saying and uh, daisy made the comment um you know also you're not even quoting other women we we quote the men um so the men never impact. quote women it, never mm -hmm. never Never. Okay. If the men are, are worried about their sort of show time, actual, you know, screen time at conference, maybe maybe a few of them could get together and do a musical item or something. I don't know. <laughs> or maybe we could give them the assignment of doing the flower decorations, something to make them feel special and, and included mm. in the event. Yeah. And useful. Yeah. yeah. I mean, I, I just want to... If I had 10 years to... If I had 10 years to prepare a talk, there is no way I'd be as boring as most of them are. <laughs> I mean, that's 10, really 10, 10 years, it's and that's, it'd be a, it'd and that's all they can come up with. <laughs> it's the same old dreck. Well, yes, obviously, but uh, I could yeah. do it as poetry. But um, <laughs> but the outer dreck, they, you know, this just shows that, that. Well, of course, the main reason is by that logic is because they've given dozens of leadership roles to men and hardly any to women. Yep. Um. So that's why the numbers don't work. It's not yep. like. Oh, it's fair. There's <laughs> nothing to do with being <laughs> fair. Uh, but but honestly, it shows the kind of caliber of person they call to be the 70s. <laughs> yeah. Um that that they if you if you know you got your one shot to speak to the whole church in 10 years and you've been a general authority and you've been around to still say such utter non-interesting dreck in most cases. Um, and just clone all the other talks shows how much these men are carefully chosen to have no imagination whatsoever and yes, no courage the, and nothing American interesting to say. Drek is a yeah. word that comes to us courtesy of the German language um, and in the English usage okay. describes a sludge or a slime or just something desperately uninteresting. Um, I'm going to go to the bottom paragraph here because it gets worse. Some might suggest that all nine women general leaders speak in every general conference. While this is certainly possible, it is not practical, practical or advisable. Why? Uh, these sisters, unlike the general authorities, are intended to serve on a part-time basis. Some of them continue in their full-time employment while serving as general officers. In addition, most church members are likely unaware of the large number of speaking assignments these sisters receive each year. A recent review shows that on average, each of these sisters is assigned six to seven major published addresses at General Conference, BYU's Women Conference, BYU, BYU-Idaho Devotionals, Education Week, and Public Affairs events. Eight to ten talks at training and leadership meetings and institute area and state devotionals, etc. These numbers don't include articles and other public appearances that require their attendance and sometimes impromptu remarks. If they're so damn busy, pay them and make it a full-time job for them then. Thoughts, do the men, do the men, just do the men so... not do any of that? Do I, the, I believe... I mean, um, just do so... the men not do any of that? I believe the apostles that speak at every conference do a lot of that. So Do they not? Well, they get to do it for yeah, time, is, is the point. So they, they have all of this time because they are being paid for that time. Ooh. Women, the women that we're talking about, are fitting it in amongst their other roles. 
I kind of like that that's been, mm. you know, that's been highlighted there in black and white because you're right, the, the obvious thing is, well, can't we have parity and paid roles for women because it brings equal pay into it too yeah. it just makes it worse but um for, for me I guess my, my first thought is well I, I am familiar with these men I know what their faces look like because there are opportunities even remotely to hear them I don't know any of these women in fact we've mm. sort of called for more to be speaking to women are asking to mm. hear from other women so could we maybe do that i mean if unless the geography that they're kept to is such a small area um i could go my entire life and not hear from any of the women who are called into these roles so i, I think what this letter really highlights is that the the um general mm -hmm. female leaders of this church are the only ones who are actually serving and doing it as service rather than as employment uh, that's what the, that's what that letter absolutely nails down, because what they're saying is you're you're doing it on top of your day job, on top of running your family lives um, and for free, whereas the rest of the guys are getting paid to do this job. Yeah. There are there are six. There are six men who aren't paid also as uh, as general officers. You've got the young men's presidency and the Sunday school presidency. They're I think they're making enough paid. money off of yeah I think compared to the 90 something that off of them um, side are, hustles yeah well Brad yeah. Wilcox gets paid to teach young men about their bits and pieces even Men's, though he's entirely yeah. unqualified Maturation, Jane? Whatever they call it. yeah can, can I promise I'll raise my hands more in the future but I feel like mm. because this is women's section it's just like we're just tumbling on in yeah. um I need to say that I really appreciate the time that you're giving over in this discussion to the issue of role oh. the role of women in conference for the simple reason that so much pain has especially in this past few weeks built up we're seeing community of christ who have not only called a, a woman apostle for the first time in it's the history of any restoration president. tradition uh, pre president, prophet yeah. president and um and they're celebrating having given women the priesthood you know, years and years ago. The 80s, wasn't it? Right, yeah, 30 years ago. We, 1994. We were, 1994. We, we, were, we are still talking about just hearing the voices of, of women. Um, I really appreciate the fact that we can talk about this and that women are being listened to. Women have been speaking out. For, I've never seen anything like mm -hmm. what happened um, with Instagram where mm -hmm. en masse women felt for the what seemed like for the first time many of them were saying, look, this doesn't feel true. When you tell me I have authority this uh, and that I have you know equal, equal uh, opportunity and leadership, that, that doesn't feel true to me. They are publicly talking about it. They're publicly expressing that pain. And what's happening, I think, is women are choosing to uh, cope with conference in extremely creative ways. Sometimes that is getting the hell out and just, you know what, I, I'm going to make some donuts. Sometimes it's like her, Sarah, um, getting the hell out of Dodge. I'm going on holiday this weekend because I am going to practice self-care more than I, I want to listen to these really traumatic things that upset me, um, you know, every time. And and Ruth, you're you're literally listening in because uh, you like Nemo, right? And and we're going to we're going to do a session together, not because we want to be there. Every time women show up to listen to stuff, it hurts us. Oh. Yeah. And and I think yeah. Jane there has spoken more than any woman will speak at general conference. So she's had more airtime than they will. And I think the, this discussion in total of minutes will have more minutes possibly mm -hmm. than uh, all the women's talks at conference combined, very possibly. Uh, if we talk about it for about 30 minutes, that should do it. Peter, that actually Peter can get us over the 30 minute mark. Off you go. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I just want to also point out it's utterly illogical, contradictory nonsense. The fact that women are giving all these talks means they can trial run them. Your general mm -hmm. conference talks is your greatest hits. We heard Alan Phillips, um, the new <laughs> British 70, give his talk. And we've heard most of what he puts in his conference talk before you know, in his local talks. David at Hyde given. Park. Mm. So they, mm. yeah, so there's literally no rational ounce of truth or reason in the in the reason they gave. They've said these women are giving lots and lots of talks. Exactly. Therefore, it's a doddle for them to come up with a general conference talk because they've already got loads mm. and they can refine their message and try it out just like the men. 
um you know it's and it's not like the general conference talks are long so it's a, it's it's easy peasy pudding and pie to write a conference talk when that's what you're doing so much with your daily life and can already. i just jump in there a sec peter um, it's total nonsense yeah i just jump in and say that it's i don't like here the way that they essentially value the need of general mm. authority 70s to speak at conference it's like the the quorum of the There's 12 70 of them the, well yeah and the general leadership of the church so general young men's general young women's general leaf society general primary they speak to they are the highest positions over certain groups mm. within the church mm. so hearing from them is surely more important than hearing to hearing from a 70 mm. who serves on the correlation committee yeah right would you rather hear from your primary president or a man who sits right. in an office in Salt Lake administrating the affairs of the church behind the scenes. Mm. Their message yeah. is less important than... Because, sure, yeah, the apostles' message are important because they're sustained as prophets, seers, and revelators. They speak for God. Of course we want to hear from them every time. I get that. And would I want women in that position? Sure. And that's a slightly different point because, like I said, the church is in charge of these ratios. They could put as many women in as they want, in theory, into those senior leadership positions. All it takes is asking God and getting a little bit of revelation, should the time be right. Um, what, what is but this the meme? 70s aren't as important as they're making out, is my point. Sarah, please. What is this nonsense as well, that they want all the general authorities to talk soon after being called? Well, are they not applying that to the same to the women? Well, because really Sister Spanels possibly possible after they've been called. Sister Spanels was called in 2022, and she mm. still mm. hasn't spoken. And so I predict she's probably right. going to speak at this session. But that's going to be coming on two years, if not at least oh. 18 months since she, oh. you know, since she was called, and she's still not spoken. So. Again, where's that prioritization of those that are called getting to speak soon after? I think they're patterning it of want to hear them after our they've... heavenly mothers, where where it's complete and utter silence from one <laughs> half of our yeah. uh, eternal family. Peter, and then yeah. we'll we'll go I to want the last to, page I, of this letter. I want to hear seventies after they've had some experience. I don't want to hear them the minute yeah. they've been called. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You can imagine, though, this is like a carrot they offer because when a 70 is yeah. called to the first quorum, they have to uproot their whole family and their lives. They are now mm -hmm. going to be slaves of the church for the next quite a while. Um, and they might be posted anywhere in the world. This is a huge upheaval for their children and for their spouses and for themselves. Um, mm -hmm. So you can see how dangling a quick talking conference at them uh, kind of locks them in. But yeah. I would want to hear them after they've been doing it for 10 years and they've got some experience and some wisdom. And we're going to get traveled some new, a bit. Yeah. We're going to get some new GA 70s this year because I've looked at some of the current 70s and some of them are going to be turning 70 this year. And so, you know, they will be let go. We'll, we'll say goodbye to several of them. Um, and we don't know who their replacements are going to be. But when their replacements come in, you know, they will probably talk this session. Alan Phillips gets called in as a GA70. The moment the session that he's called in, he gets to speak. Right? Sister mm -hmm. Spanels has got to wait two years. If she even speaks this session, I think she will, but we don't know. Um, let's move on to the second page of this because there's more. Um, because this is just the ice on the gate. One might also suggest the wives of the general authorities or other sisters be invited to speak on a regular basis. However, these sisters are not called or authorized to address the general church. <laughs> it is sincerely hoped oh, that this information sake. will help you understand the realities and complexities of the general conference speaking assignments. The first That's presidency extends to you their kindest hand. regards and best wishes. And also, wasn't it only a couple of years ago that some 17-year-old girl spoke in general conference? Just a random young woman spoke. So they can be authorized should the need occur, clearly. So it's very simple to authorize the wives of apostles to speak they speak whenever apostles go around on speaking assignments around the world they travel yeah. with their husband and they'll often speak at the same time and it's sometimes some of the best talks that are given pat holland bless her when she spoke it's excellent because she said all i want to do is just stay in england because it's lovely i was like thank you i appreciate that <laughs> uh jane you look ready but to let's, yeah let's just underline yeah. that that in general these women do not have the authority to speak. They have not been called. Right. They do not have the authority to speak in conference. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, yeah. But let's, ooh, I can do full screen. Let's go to this, though, because I want to know not only who will stand 
but who will sit? I know, Peter, it's all jumping all over the place. Um, because Nelson used this uh, conference, as he always uses every opportunity, to talk about himself. Uh, he put an Instagram post out, and there isn't a paragraph of it that isn't about him. And it's meant to be his post about, oh, are you looking forward to conference? Um, so I'll read this out. Dear brothers, sisters, and friends, how grateful I am that we can watch, listen to, or attend General Conference of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints this weekend. I know that the general authorities and general officers of the church who will speak to us have prepared thoughtfully to teach us what the Lord would have them teach. I encourage you to view each session prepared to make notes of the spiritual impressions you receive. Okay, all generic, vague so far. For each of us, time marches on. As many of you know, because you don't shut up about it, I am closing in on my 100th birthday. Though my body reminds me every day that it is nearly a century old and to go easy on it, I honestly don't know where the years have gone. They have simply flown by. As senior leaders in the church, we are called to serve for the remainder of our lives, often long beyond retirement age. This means that you may see some of us during general conference speak while sitting down or pre-record our message to be shared at the appropriate time or even require a little assistance getting to and from our seats in the conference centre. From my point of view, here he goes, talking about himself again, this is cause for celebration. Sounds a bit masochistic, but all right. I thank the Lord every day for the privilege of still being here with you. I cherish working alongside colleagues who are wearing out their lives in service of, to our Heavenly Father and His Son, Jesus Christ, despite the aches and creaks that come with advancing age. I don't have words to express how grateful I am for strong colleagues on whom I can lean in many ways as we strive to serve the Lord. May each of us, regardless of our individual circumstances, listen with open hearts and minds to what we hear this weekend so that the Lord can continue to direct each of us in our individual paths. And because I couldn't leave an opportunity to not make this about myself, um, taking after Russell Nelson's example, I've shared my comment that I made on that post there, which is, is this why I'm hearing the sustaining vote will be Saturday morning instead of Saturday afternoon? And not so that those planning to vote opposed will go to the wrong session, question mark. Um, they haven't answered mm. me that one. But what do you guys make of this? What do you make of this uh, post, Russell Nelson, talk about how it's great that they're um, they're all wearing out their it's bodies? It's great that they're too old. It's great that they're too old to be able to cope and function easily. And it's great that they've been completely worn into the ground in the very last days of their life. Mm. Uh, Jane, then Peter? I, this only yeah, works if... I'm yeah, going to positivity first, right? The, <laughs> and I genuinely mean this. It's it's not it's not false positivity, but you you all know that um that something that I feel really strongly about is how um, ageism is one of the very few types of bias that seems to be you know really quite common and accepted in society. And so I I don't like it. I don't like it whenever we take pops at sort of the general you know because they're old of course you're getting you know you're an elder in a community you have a lot of experience that's wonderful you should be absolutely we should listen and learn from you where it becomes problematic is when there is just one view that's being presented and that overall we're seeing a very very na narrow lens by which the church is led and sees the world and its needs through um despite your access to the heavens i think though what I, what I get really excited about, because I know that, that Peter, you, you feel quite excited when we can see glimpses of possibilities for the church. We do need younger people. We, we should be celebrating older people. How, how old is too old? Nobody likes seeing President oh, actually, I, I know how old up. too old is. Let me just put it on screen. This is too old. When well, the combined age of your senior leadership, the top three men in your church, is 280 years old. When they combined are older than the church itself. If there was more balance thing. that brought, I don't care how the high number is, if, as long as you have enough people that are bringing balance to that number. So we need some younger voices. We need we need more inclusivity and more diversity, absolutely, amongst the Quorum of the Twelve. And age, yes, is a part of that, absolutely. Um, but while we hate, how, how much pain are we in when we see, um, you know, particularly President Eyring struggling to stand and, mm. and we're all thinking, you have to let this man retire. Mm -hmm. Yes, I absolutely yeah. do think apostles should be able to retire and prophets yeah. too. I do believe that. Mm -hmm. But what really excites me about this is 
if we want to be an inclusive, engaging church, and we've learned the lessons we should have from COVID, and uh, because so many of us have walked with our, you know, just we, we voted with our feet and didn't go back because there weren't the opportunities to, the church didn't change in ways that we needed. Here, we can see from on high, you can pre-record a talk. You can sit and give your talk. What if our wards and congregations and state conferences were like that? What if we could see instead of, you know, you're 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 now in a care home and you may be lucky if you see a member of the church once a year to come and if they if they want to do carol singing, you're actually, if you want to accept that assignment, you could participate, you could give a talk. Um I feel really excited by the possibilities that technology allows if they lean into it. The problem is it's only happening because they have a need they're not looking at general membership and say how can we make sure that our elderly members are able to fully participate so let's do more of that mm. peter and then amen Tara. yeah yeah i agree i mean the ageism in the church is anti-youth and it's destroyed it you know as soon as brigham young introduced the idea of longevity of service being how you become a leader, not revelation, not the gift of prophecy, just how long you've been in a calling, and then who dies. Um, I'm framing that as somehow prophetic and divine and guided by God. Um, you, you, you've created a gerontocracy, so they are absolutely, you know, taking all power for themselves and their age group. The other thing is, while while at the moment our current first presidency have been fairly sharp, although President Eyring always looks like he's having mini strokes in press conferences, bless him. Um, I got you know I'm I got called on my mission, uh, by a letter signed by a machine, pretending to be the living prophet guiding the church and speaking the world today, who we found out later was already in a coma. And that has that's quite a salutary experience because I went on my mission testifying that, you know, we got this living prophets, the best thing ever, better than all the other churches come and believe our leader. And they they guide us today and they help us navigate the modern world. And they're clearly not doing that. And they're in ignorance of the modern world. They're oblivious. They're scared of it. They condemn it. They don't get it on really basic levels and everyone in the bureaucracy feeds them false information and data or massages it to make them think everything's going really well so they're being lied to by the whole system but that's because they punish people if they tell them the truth they've they've made that the situation themselves the other thing is with the the focus on his age very soon after President Nelson became president, they had a gala celebration for his birthday, like the first year he was in or something. Mm -hmm. Huge fandango, paid for from tithing, no doubt. Big celebrities. At the same time as he announced ending pageants and parties and social life for the members. Yeah, put it in the you handbook know, that we shouldn't celebrate unnecessary emperor. landmarks. Oh. Yeah. yeah. Um, and, and all of that. And 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 I've already heard, I think, from slight semi-official channels, people starting with this idea that we're all meant to be having local celebrations for his hundredth birthday when it happens. <laughs> that's a person. That's a per on. that's a cult of personality. Mm. This is making him personally the the hero. And his wife, Wendy, you know, people said, you know, on their world tour, Wendy said a lot. She did speak to the whole church in lots of ways, although they immediately scrubbed everything from the internet after every one of their talks. Um, but she has been bigging him up as the best thing since sliced bread. His unofficial third polygamous wife, Sherry Jew, does the same. He can see around corners. There's no one more perfect than my, we'll find out later, their already sealed husband, President Nelson. Um, and it, it's just that that's the problem here. It's elderly dying emperors who often are in dementia. For most of his presidency, President Monson was in dementia. He was unable to function. They were just keeping him alive and feeding him ice cream, apparently, while pretending that he was leading the church. And they even did sort of patronising things in conference, you know, sort of alluding to this and, you know, about his old age. That we can't be a voice for the 21st century holding on to its young people if mostly what we're doing is venerating and tiptoeing around dying old men 
who are totally entrenched in their patriarchal and arrogant egos um, mm. and never address the real issues or think to the future because they're oh. going to die. Therefore, it's easy for them to say the world's ending tomorrow because their world's ending tomorrow. Peter, but loads of us have got to keep living it for decades. They're securing their, fe their future it. through nepotism. They're securing <laughs> yeah. the future. They're, they are focused on the younger generation. I mean, just at this Thursday session of, of leadership, um, you know, David A. Bednar's son, Eric D. Bednar, became a Area Authority 70. Not a General Authority 70, not paid yet, but he's an Area 70, and we know that that can be a calling that does lead to becoming a General Authority 70. It happened to Alan Phillips. Um, so the nepotism continues. I'm sure he was Bruce? the right man for the job. <laughs> well, yeah, we we needed a um, orthodontist from Kentucky. That's what we needed. Um, I just think, sorry, I didn't say anything yeah. about them getting, getting old. I, I, you know what I'm like, and I'm, I'm getting more and more. Um, let it, let it burn, let it burn. The older they are, the the more more decrepit they look, the more out of touch they look, the better, in my opinion, because it just throws into stark reality for the whole world to see, Mormon and non-Mormon alike, how out of touch this church is with with actual people and their needs. These people live in absolute luxury. Um, uh, on the tithe payers dime and they have the best medical care and the best resources pushed around them and they will literally walk past homeless people to get into conference this weekend step over the oh. the, the literal bodies in the street um and not be there to to help the the people that need their well, help they won't because they their needs and and we should be clapping them and standing up for them as they walk in and saying what a good job you're doing no but i'm happy for you to stand there and be the absolute poster boy for how mormonism is out of touch of, with the realities of even being a christian so mm -hmm. but you know yeah, why they won't walk over in, those people top. right because they'll get in their little golf the carts tunnel. yeah they're... in the tunnels that, yeah, uh, those tunnels. So they don't are... have to look at the reality exactly. of life. So yeah. they don't have to see outside of mm. the very carefully curated bubble in which they live. Yeah. So, so let them stay at the top. Let them yeah. be that poster boy for Mormonism. I'm happy for it to happen. And the only thing that is worse than um, than Nelson staying at the top is Oaks coming into control because of the the damage that he will do, mm. the further damage that he will do to the poor. Um, youth yeah. of the church the um the lgbtq community of the church um women of the church but again let him show himself for who he truly is and and we will we'll see you know what that does mm. to mormonism in the same way as that woman's ridiculous comments that went live on instagram and then they had to quickly try and pull it back what that did to to believing members hearts let alone mm. as ex mos that sit here going fine i'm here with my popcorn i'll watch it go down yeah um yeah let's get to our predictions shall we um sarah what is your prediction for general conference your full screen live to the internet One, what do you think is going to happen i can absolutely guarantee there will be no apologies to the lgbt community for hate and exclusion and marginalization guarantee there'll be no apology and no we really genuinely are going to change things for you there will be absolutely no apology to victims of abuse or their families or those that have seen and suffered and experienced abuse or seen it with anybody they care about. In the truth, the church doesn't apologise. They will hold fast to that. I, yep. My prediction is the three women speakers, maybe one woman might offer a closing prayer. Um, temples will come to later, won't we? Yeah. Um, and I think I'm pretty certain that somewhere along the lines they're going to get hold of the idea that they should invite the entire Brit Venger group and 21st century saints to come and talk about safeguarding at general conference. That's what there I think. <laughs> um, Ruth, what are your predictions? My my prediction, and I'll I'll take this as prophecy. Okay. Is that there'll be no no prophecy? There will be no revelation. Right. There will be there'll be nothing that they can say that they could look back at in twenty years, thirty years time, and go, that was really prophetic. That really changed the direction of things for the better. Um, they will strain at a gnat, and um, and I think 
they will reveal to the world even more so how out of touch they are with the needs of the world and and what would actually make a difference to this this planet and humanity mm. as we as we limp through life um so yeah i i think they offer no nothing new nothing of value um and if anything all they're going to do is cause a little bit more heartbreak to believing members okay peter your predictions not for um, the entire future of the church um but for this general that, conference you can hear <laughs> i did a, had a great episode um collaborating with uh latter day digest um with gene judson so we've released a joint episode of what they should say in conference if they want the church to survive um i'm with you in a way the prediction is all the things they won't do they won't do or say anything useful to save the church while it crashes into its final death spiral. Um, but they will absolutely be so gormless and tone deaf. They will have Annette Dennis, who's stirred up all the controversy, speaking at General Conference with her primary voice. Um, and s somewhere in what she says, there will be more outrageous stuff that just riles everyone even more. Um, she'll be there because they did that with Brad Wilcox after his scandal they kept mm -hmm. him front and centre and it, have done ever since. Do you, do you think it's their way of showing that they sort of stand behind that person and they're not, you know? Well, yeah, but also they don't care. They literally don't care. They don't understand PR. They don't understand the people. They don't, they, they just, they are so arrogant that everything they think of must be God's will. Uh, they don't even question it. Um, they they just carry on as they are. And while they do that, the whole building falls mm -hmm. down around them, you know? Cool. So that's what we're going to see. We're going to have Jane. Hey, oh, hey. Um, Your prediction. <laughs> yeah, same as Daisy May. I reckon that the Tab Choir are going to do Come Thou Fount since they announced that's going to be the mm -hmm. new hymn book. I reckon because okay. that song is a banger and we're all mm -hmm. here for it. Um, I think they're going to promote the humanitarian aid that they do more. I think so. I think we're going to maybe hear something about that. I would love for them to have leaned into Earth Stewardship, which they don't seem to be getting. They seem to be leaning into how generous they are. There will be a comeback talk and lots mm -hmm. of references to the 100th birthday coming up of... Uh, someone isn't someone going to be 100 quite oh i heard right? someone might be 100 <laughs> yeah, so, someone um yeah. but yeah the only reason the only reason the only prediction i care about and just because it's now and i've given up hope really but i'll put it out there just because just just for the sake of um tradition a scottish temple thank you very much <laughs> There we go. Okay. Stop, you don't need to laugh like that. <laughs> I mean, honestly. Right. Um, before we get to the predictions of the viewers, um, I will take this opportunity to wave my little tin cup and tell you all that I am going to be listening to all nine and a half hours of General Conference this weekend. And if that isn't worth liking this video, liking those videos, subscribing to the channel to watch me suffer, uh, and if you're able, financially contributing to the work that I do, then I don't know what is, frankly. Um, if if that doesn't earn your your love and support, then I, I don't know what will. Uh, <laughs> uh, but I'm really excited to hang out with you all and have you see you all in the comments. Uh, and I am really, really excited that I get to pick through your predictions and put them uh, on the channel because you guys are the ones that support me and help me and you're the reason that i make videos because you're here to watch them if i was just screaming into an empty room i don't think that would be i mean i'd probably still do it actually to be fair because i just like the sound of my own voice um so with that to be said let's get to the predictions of the viewers da, da, da. right so these are direct quotes um, oh, yes, I will need money to stock up on Jammy Dodgers. Thank you very much, Mormon Freedom Fairy. If you don't know, I am essentially powered by Jammy Dodgers. Um, so, yeah, that's how that works. Uh, right, viewers' predictions. I predict at least one instance of forced such pantomime tears. What do we think, panel? Simple yes or no? We could thumbs yes. up, thumbs down type thing. Yes. And who? One, two, three. Iring. Iring. Oh, Iring. <laughs> yeah, yeah, okay, right. Yeah, that is that is correct. Okay, um, maybe this is the conference where coffee becomes legal. Oh, yes, I hope so. No. Oh, no. Yeah, no, no. Okay, no. 
On a similar vein, now that marijuana is legal in many states, maybe it will become legal in Mormonism. Can I say that would be hilarious? Can you Mm. imagine general conference if everybody's kind of high on a mountain top and leave? Yeah. yeah, yeah, and yeah. No people coffee, have, you know, no coffee, but but weed but, but is weed. a bit weed. Can you imagine? Can you just imagine the missionary contingent high on weed. <laughs> That it's would be something. Thought. That would almost be as funny as a Scottish temple. Uh, <laughs> oh, the next per- <laughs> Nemo. The next, I, I am traveling to Scotland next week. Um, you might not be traveling back again if you keep this yeah. up, Nemo. <laughs> yeah, I don't know why I'm doing this to myself. Um, clearly, I'm about to be at Jane's mercy. So, okay. Well, to make Jane happy, I predict women get the priesthood. Um, that's a prediction <laughs> that someone has made. Um, someone said, and I quote, something about how women are blessed with priesthood power in their callings, but yet not ordained to the priesthood. Yep. Yeah, I think say that. we'll get something like that. I think we'll, we'll get like a changing of the rhetoric around the priesthood. Um, we'll start talking about like priesthood work that men and women engage in or, you know, something like that. Right. Mm-hmm. Um, this is one of my favorite predictions. Um, and if you're watching, hopefully you're watching, you'll know that this is you. You'll remember your comment. Uh, someone just put tithes. How wonderful President Nelson is. Tithes. And <laughs> bravo. I think Way I've heard that talk. Conference. I think I've already heard that talk. Yeah. Oh, I think Cook yeah. gave it last conference. <laughs> or Anderson, <laughs> one of the two. Um, the next person says the church will be using its slush fund to start its own space program. We can finally meet those Quakers <laughs> Joseph was talking about. The six foot yeah, Quakers on the moon. Um, yes. I, I don't we... think it will be in conference, but I absolutely think it gets discussed. <laughs> yes. yes. I think someone's asking. Um, w- they will allow 12 year old girls that can pass the sacrament to women, uh, to pass the sacrament. Uh, Women and gay couples may take sacrament mm. and hold callings. I mean, women could already take uh, sacrament. Already callings. happening. I, yes, oh, but gay couples yes. are, without getting into all the controversy oh. over that, we know that that is, oh, is happening. Um, priesthood to sister missionaries. So not to women in general, but to sister missionaries. Mm. Mm. No. Mm-hmm. No. no. Uh, and then this one, which is almost absolutely 100% true. Yes. They stress the importance of not listening to people who have left the LDS church, saying those who leave the church may damage their testimonies and suggest subtly that ex-Mormons are influenced by the adversary. Yeah. What do we think yeah. of that? Yes. Ooh, okay, right. We've got my predictions up next. Uh, before we go there, I just need to get something um, from my little pot here. Very important. Okay, right. Um, so this behind me here, is a lump of um, Salt Lake granite. Um, this is granite from the same quarry, the Salt Lake Temple. Lindsay Hansen Park brought it over to Sunstone. Very lovely little gift. This, for the American viewers, is a flat cap. Traditional, tweed in colour. Very, very British thing. Have you got um, a ferret? <laughs> my, my, my whippet is currently at the vet. Um, now, it's quilted inside and everything. It's lovely. So... What we shall do is we shall take the stone, pop it in the hat, like so, and then if I if I do this, and then I can read my predictions. Ahem. These are the official Nemo uh, predictions for General Conference. Dallin Lake Jokes will be sustaining uh, in the first session of conference. Jared B. Larson. We'll do the auditing. I'm not even looking in the hat because it's nonsense. Um, Jeffrey R. Holland will speak. He'll be back. It'll be his first time speaking in a couple of conferences. He will be well enough. He's now the acting president of the Quorum of the Twelve. Uh, Jay Annette Dennis, I think, will then speak after him. Alexander Dushku, who was called, will speak. Um, he's a former Kurt McConkie lawyer, um, but he's not spoke yet, so you know he's got to speak quickly. Uh, Ulysses Suarez will then speak Jack and Gerard will then speak Henry B. Eyring will then speak Notice how Henry B. Eyring and Dan H. Oaks are in that first session And they won't appear again, I predict, until the Sunday morning session So that they only have to schlep to one session of conference Because they're both getting older The second session, because we've freed up all that time Will be quite a big session uh, Because we're not having to do the sustaining and the auditing department there uh, So we'll have David A. Bednar 
then Massimo De Feo, who was our European overlord until we um, changed the Europe areas. Uh, Brent H. Nielsen, I believe is from the presidency of the 70. Uh, host Jose L. Alonso will be speaking to us. Garrett Gong will speak to us, and I reckon he may well manage to steer clear of talking about women's clothes this time. Uh, Michael oh. T. Nelson, not sure how he's related to Russell M. Nelson, but he will be speaking. Uh, and he is the only person speaking who I think is called brother because he's on the Young Men's General Presidency. So he's not an elder. He's brother Michael T. Nelson, I think, if I'm recalling correctly. And then Quinton L. Cook will regale us, I'm sure, with his ancestry and how much he loves Britain. Um, <sighs> then we will hear from uh, the Mormon James Bond himself, Shane M. Bowen, chief spy extraordinaire of the Mormon Church of the Strengthening Church Members Committee. Stephen R. Bangata, who has a highway in Utah named after him. Um, that's how widespread in Utah the Bangata name is. Um, then I think Sister Spanels will speak. Uh, I think she will she will speak to us uh, finally. Matthew L. Carpenter will speak. And then Dieter F. Uchtdorf, our beloved, will speak. Uh, on to Sunday morning. Ronald A. Rasband. Then Susan H. Porter. Susan H. Porter, I don't think has spoken before yet either. So she'll be another one. Dale G. Renland. Paul B. Piper. Everyone, a moment of silence and the national anthem for Patrick Kieran. Uh, he will speak to us in his capacity as an apostle. I'm sure he'll be lovely and humble and uh, won't quote President Nelson because he won't feel the need just about yet. Brian K. Taylor will speak to us. Dan H. Oaks will then speak to us. And I reckon that Iring will conduct this session um, so that they are combined together. Um, and yeah, they don't have to come to the conference center. And then finally... We'll have Christofferson, Godoy, Stevenson, Matthias Held, Neil L. Anderson, Mark L. Pace, and Russell M. Nelson. Russell M. Nelson will announce 15 temples, I predict. Yeah. Three women will speak, and zero apologies will be given. Thoughts on that just before mm -hmm. I... Um, just I think your I... rock and your hat are fairly accurate. It's I a good hat and a good that. rock. I think I think we can almost guarantee Jeffrey R. Holland will talk about his near death experience. Mm, well, mm. let's get to that, shall we? Right. Under who could say what? I think Rasband no. will say the words. I am sorry um, about what and for what we do not know, but um, the spirit guides are telling me that's what what we'll get. Holland will talk about his near death hospital stay. I, I think you're absolutely right, Sarah. Uchtdorf will talk about planes because Uchtdorf will do what Uchtdorf oh. does. Uh, almost everyone will be talking about covenants, covenants, covenants. It will be very important. Um, what could change? I, I, I've already said the sustaining could change. I think the sustaining is going to be on the Saturday morning. I, I hear that from a very, uh, a very good source. Uh, the conducting, I think we'll see people other than the First Presidency conducting because they're getting old. If they're getting too old that they need help getting up and down to the pulpit, it would stand to reason that they're not going to be getting up and down to the pulpit constantly. So they'll want to minimize that. So apostles will step in, I reckon. And then I think we'll hear a non-LDS hymn, possibly one that could feature in the new hymn book, possibly not, but certainly not one that is currently part of our canon of hymns. That's what I reckon. So thus are the words that the spirit spake to me through the stone in the hat. Well, I have a question, Nemo. Do mm. you do you have a prediction for who the MVP of conference is going to be? Is it the like, prophet will Butkus, it be huh? Uncle? No, or, or, oh, like, no. in Europe, well, yeah. yeah. Who will that the be? PBK That's an, award. an excellent. It's Anderson but, or um, Cook almost every year. Okay. Do you think Uncle Patrick Keaton might, Uncle Patrick might, might, be, the MVP? might be the talk? Might be the talk to watch, or do you? Do you I don't think he'll come out too bold. I think he's just going to come out quite meek and lovely. That's my prediction. I don't. I don't think he'll be quite as radically as he as he has been in years past. Because I think he's now, he's now no longer a seventy with nothing to lose because he will be made emeritus. He's now trying to play the game a bit more. So he's going to be himself. He's going to be lovely, but um, he will, yeah. Um, mm. I think I think he'll have to calm it down a little bit. He can't be too nice to refugees and and sexual assault victims um, now that he's part of the machine that I won't say anymore um, for legal reasons. Uh, anyone else got any thoughts on on this? Holland, I think um, it's it's I think in a way the screaming silence is going to become increasingly 
what we see here you know none of uh, until the people in their 90s die and get replaced by people a little bit younger um mm. and feistier um for good or bad i think we're just in a holding pattern now uh i don't think anyone's going to be risking anything radical but i do think just just as a sort of another perspective the fact mm. that even though uh oaks and others have doubled down on homophobic rhetoric the fact that we now have a clear LGBTQ ally as President Newsroom, although they've kept he's kept himself well out of the the limelight for mm. months, it, um, they are baptizing transitioned trans people. They have put into the the general handbook that people should respect people's preferred pronouns if they're trans, and that we have a very high profile married uh, same sex couple with callings and. Um, taking the sacrament in their wards um i think this points to civil war i think this points if this do was you the politburo, I think it's we the were, name of your podcast we, funnily <laughs> enough um but if this was the politburo these are all practical signals that the younger apostles have had it with the homophobia they i think they are having very tense conversations behind closed doors i think the mm. the dam is going to burst and all of these things indicate a change is a coming which is long overdue and everyone's been telling them they just see too many people who have left because they have lgbtq family members or are lgbtq and won't tolerate the hostility to that and the feminism is is a looming issue so i think this is a calm before a storm um and the more they double down the more they will in a sense reveal themselves to be completely oblivious to what's going on in their own church um mm -hmm. and the younger apostles somehow are asserting themselves um because they know they've got to keep running this church for decades after nelson pops his clogs and oaks has done everything he can to make it impossible for them to backtrack on the family proclamation or or the the lgbtq phobia but somehow they're they're going to make it happen in baby steps like they always mm. do and those baby steps have already started which okay. clearly points to quite a, a schism amongst the apostles can i get final and thoughts who knows the if they'll try and send little signals on that but that's what's going on behind the scenes okay uh final thoughts ruth and then sarah then jane and i will give my final ultimate prediction uh, and we'll wrap up um, I, I think, sadly, that the, the the final thought that I have is it's going to be another conference that's a great big nothing burger with nothing of value to actually help people yeah. in their in their relationship with with you know a savior or, or even in their relationships with each other as family members. I think there'll be divisiveness. I think there'll be those dog whistle comments um, that them and us. Um, communities and I and I feel like it, it general conference that which really should be a, a time to come together um, and bring people closer to one another it tends to be a time where the and I say this very much in inverted commas the faithful um, pat each other on the back blow smoke up Nelson's arse and then um, and and find excuses for why they are doing so very little to make a difference to their community, to their world, to the to help and ease the suffering around them that is visible to see. Um, and and that's that's a real shame. And I, you know, I get my heart broken a little bit every time that we come back together and we hope for for better. And we hope these people that are in such positions of 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 power to make a change with a great big checkbook sat beside them do do absolutely nothing, not even little, do absolutely nothing to bring about change. Hmm. Sarah, thank you very much, Ruth. Okay, All right. open, raw, and vulnerable for just a few moments. General Conference breaks me every year. Every year, it's another stab in the heart, another punch in, in the guts. It's another, oh, sorry, you consolation prize because you're not really quite, you're not like this nice heterosexual, so you can't, you could have a consolation prize and it breaks me every year. And this year, I thought, I can't do the gut punches anymore to the LGBT community. I can't do it again another year. Hence, I'm taking my tent and going and picture myself in some gale force hurricane that's going to be happening in the Scottish coast. But I'm off because I can't do it. And I've actually had to have a conversation with Jane and say, listen, when you listen to conference, 
just can you warn me what the gut punches are as they come because I can't do them anymore. So that's just a bit of a vulnerability for me about general conference and where it gets me, which is why I'm abandoning my beautiful, lovely Brit Venture crew that I absolutely love with all my heart on conference weekend and leaving you guys to get on with it because I just need to go and not get smacked in the face again. That's fair. That said, that's a vulnerable raw bit. That said, we're not going to hear anything of any value i don't believe to anybody there'll be no new prophecy there'll be nothing exciting there'll be nothing that we can get our teeth into to say this is how we can make a difference in the world there'll be some boasting about how much is spent on humanitarian aid fund there'll be some absolute wonderful boasting about how amazing the women of the church are there will be some rhetoric about how much we love everybody but let's not love them too too much because that's a bit kept dangerous isn't it but we've got a world where there are wars raging. Wars are raging in every corner of this world. We've got children dying of starvation, of lack of medical care, of a lack of clean water. We've got a climate that is being destroyed beyond anything that we've experienced before. We've got absolute out of control, despair, suicide, loneliness, isolation. And what are we going to be told? Pay your tithing, come to church on a Sunday, keep the Sabbath day holy. And that'll fix all that. Follow the covenant path and everything will be okay. And that's what we're going to spend two days of conference listening to. So I admire you guys and I'll catch up with you after conference. Thanks, Sarah. Jane? Mm -hmm. Love you, Sarah. And, and I know that reflects how so many uh, people in the comments and uh, in and out of the church are feeling about conference. Um, so the self-care, you know, the the mute the hashtags, don't, don't you know, put yourself through it. And I, I know that shows like this, where you go through the halftime stuff um, so that people aren't traumatized by having to wait and experience it and wait for that gut punch every time is incredibly helpful. So I really appreciate mm. that you do this, Nemo. It is hard, I hard do. work. Yeah hard work and, uh, and you're there for the whole of it um what i would say is um there will be enough like panning for gold there will be enough little flecks in there that the people who are trying to hold on with their fingernails i think it might be enough to keep them going for another few weeks another few months maybe even another few years there, there will be enough to kind of top up the the elevated emotion that you might get to mm. experience people will flock to chat uh the the groups and there will be the sounds of mourning but th there'll be enough little things to keep keep people going i think um david archuleta he has given us the 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 real him for conference that whenever it all gets too much yeah. we can come back there and you know just just remember that this this space is under our control and that we can step away when we need to step away cool thank you very much so uh in closing my final prediction uh is that russell M. nelson will not be in the conference center i do not believe he'll attend in person i think he will call it in again and um i also wonder whether that Saturday morning where they're going to do the sustainings may well be just in case they need a solemn assembly at last minute. And on that cheery note, uh, I will see you all tomorrow for nine and a half hours of conference that I will condense into about five hours worth of halftime shows. And you can all come and spend it with me instead because we watch conference. So you don't have to. So hit the notification bells, hit the subscribe button so you don't miss it. We'll be going live five minutes after the session ends or there or thereabouts. So until tomorrow, have a great one and uh, prepare yourselves. Take care, everyone. Bye.